Good morning. Magandang umaga sa inyong. Um, <coughs> pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your unfailing love. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, my God. Amen. So today is Father's Day, and I know that it's not a happy day for everybody. Um, maybe not for some children who haven't experienced the love of their fathers the way they should have, or for children who had absent fathers, or for fathers who haven't had happy experiences with children or with their own fathers. Um, as B said, we are meant to be a family, but often with the circumstances of our times, of the place we live in, it's not always possible. Parents get separated, responsibilities get divided. It may not be a happy day for everybody. But we have a perfect role model to look towards, uh, not just fathers, not just mothers, but our Father in heaven, who is our perfect father and role model. So work with me. So when you think of a father, what are some of the roles a father has to play? Earn money, <laughs> yes, mostly, mostly. The mothers do that too, yeah? Provide, yeah? Discipline, yes, I think that's a very important factor for fathers, a very difficult job. Sorry? Breadwinner, yep. Protector, counselor, mentor, advisor, head of the home, head of the family, supporter, yep. The final say, they hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wish, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, <We're laughs> a father has spoken. <laughs> okay, when we think of God, our father, how do we relate to him? What is our relationship with God, our father? When you think of Jesus or when you think of God, who is he to you? Savior? Protector? Yes. Supporter? Healer? Yes. Redeemer? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for saying that, B, because uh, today I'm going to use uh, the parable that Jesus used to, to show us a picture of God the Father. So I'm going to talk to you about the prodigal son and the prodigal father. So the story is in Luke 15, 11 to 19. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. I put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. I'm going to use a very famous painting, Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Son. So some of you are probably familiar with it. Just to illustrate some of the characteristics of the father. So you can see in the picture, there is a father, there is a son, and in the background, there is the older son and some other people in that picture. This is a very big painting. It's about 17 feet by six feet, it's huge. So you can see all the details if you actually see the picture. I just wanted to clarify the meaning of the word prodigal. It means rashly or wastefully extravagant, somebody who goes beyond what they should be spending or giving. So giving in abundance, lavishly or profusely, so pouring over profusely. So coming back to the painting, um, I wonder if we could turn off some of the lights here so that you could see the painting clearly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the father is a very wealthy man, and you can see it by the way he's dressed. He's wearing a lot of jewelry, and he's wearing a red cape. And you can see the son, his head is shorn. I don't know whether it was a result of having to shave his head because he was living among the pigs and the garbage. Maybe he developed lice or something. And in the, in the other painting, you can in, in the full painting, you can see that he also has a dagger by his side probably to prevent himself or protect himself from marauders or gangsters among whom he was living. Now this painting is supposed to be a representation of the love, the forgiveness, the reconciliation of the Father. And that is how Jesus used it to portray our Heavenly Father. So uh, in the next um, enlargement, you will see the hands of the Father. So I did a close-up. Do you notice anything interesting about the hands? No rings on the hands? Anything else? Look carefully. Are they the same? Yeah, they're not. So you'll notice that the left hand is a masculine hand, right? It's, it's, it's a symbol of strength and authority. It's a man's hand. But if you look at the right hand, it's more feminine. Right? The fingers are graceful. So it represents the, the love and the mercy and the gentleness of the Father. So, you know, in the Bible, there are many references to God in feminine terms. When Jesus was looking over Jerusalem, he said, How often have I wanted to gather you under my wings as a hen gathers her children. So he was comparing himself to a hen. So the protectiveness, the gentleness, the compassion of a woman is also embodied in the father's hands. And of course, the strength. Uh, and you, you notice the way he's put his hands over his son. It signifies not just forgiveness and receiving his son back, but also blessing. So the hands are spread out in an in a attitude of blessing. So it's a beautiful representation of our Heavenly Father, who is a father to us, who's waiting for us to come back. Now, Scripture tells us that when the son was coming home, the father saw him from a distance, and he ran towards him. So in the culture of that time, because of the hierarchy, a father would never run towards the son. The son runs towards the father. But here's a father who has who knows the pain and anxiety of losing a child. So I'm going to go back to his face. So if you, l if you look at the close-up, you'll see that 
there are lines of worry on his face. There's pain and agony on his face because he knows what it is to love and what it is to suffer rejection by his children. So there's maybe he's crying, his eyes are half shut, maybe there's tears of joy, but also you know the pent up pain of having been rejected by a son. Now he has he's a rich man, you can see that by what he's wearing. And he did not have to give his son the inheritance. The inheritance usually comes after death. But his son, in his audacity, claimed the inheritance before his father had passed away. So in a sense, he's almost wishing for the death of his father. And the father just gives it to him. There's no debate. We don't see him saying, no, you wait till I die. He just gives it to him. And that's a reflection of the generosity of our father. We can ask, and he gives it to us. M probably at great risk to himself. So some of you who are parents, you will know what it is to love. And once you have children, sorry, those of you who have new babies, you are never going to stop worrying. It's the beginning of worry when you have children, no matter how old your children might be. So our father knows this. He knows what it is to love and lose and feel rejection. But he's waiting for us. He's running towards us to reconcile with us and to meet us back. So we know our Father loves us because the psalm says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Um, I am a flawed follower of Christ. And I have to remind myself many times of God's faithfulness for his unconditional love for me and for you. And I think as Christians, we have to base our life on the goodness of God. Things are not going to be always fine, right? In this world, we have troubles. There is going to be trouble. There is going to be tribulation. There is going to be persecution. There are going to be hard times. But we have to hold on to the truth that our God is a good God. And here are the promises in the word that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So he, s he f slaughtered the fatted calf for his son. He didn't need to. He could have said, hmm, now you're coming back to me after having squandered all my money. But he never looks back at that time. And he welcomes, it, he welcomes him, receives him, and sates his soul with goodness. What gives us the courage to come to our Father? It is a fact that we are his children. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we are not beggars. We are not slaves. We are his children. And the Bible tells us that we who are flawed human beings, we know how to give good gifts to our children, right? So how much more does our father know to give good to gifts to his children? And he gives us this right. So it is a right that we have. I can go to my father anytime. He's, he's not alive anymore. But I had a very good relationship with my father. So it, it's very easy for me to relate to God as father. And I think it's interesting that um, our God is a three-in-one person. So there's the Holy Spirit, and there's Jesus, and there's God the Father. So we might relate to each of the entities in a slightly different way. And I think God has made his personality complex and enriched so that we can relate to him on different terms. So how do I relate to the Holy Spirit? I'm in awe of the Holy Spirit. I am mystified by the Holy Spirit. And I'm empowered. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. How do we relate to Jesus? Because Jesus was a man, he came to earth, he suffered just like you and me. He probably suffered much worse than you and me. Certainly did, right? He was uh, probably ostracized because he was illegitimate. He was a 
carpenter's son. He was a nobody. He didn't have good looks. So he relates to all our travails, all our suffering, all our misdemeanors, perhaps. And then there is God the Father. So I had a very good earthly father. I was very blessed to have almost a perfect earthly father, as, as perfect as any earthly father could be. So uh, we said about how he listens to us, he forgives us. Anytime one of us would cough at night, my dad would come rushing and give us medicine in the middle of the night. Like nothing bothered him, nothing was too difficult for him. So I can imagine how God is always, his ears are attuned to us, and he's always waiting for us to come back to him. So remember, we have the right. We don't have to come cringing to him. We don't have to come crawling to him. We are his children, and we have the right to come into his presence. So those of you who go to school, you don't knock at the door and say, please, can I enter? Please, can I have the privilege of education? You don't have to do that because your father has paid the price. He has paid the fees for you. It is your right to claim education. Similarly, Jesus has bought you and me a great price. He paid with his blood for us. So that is how precious we are to God. So he doesn't take us lightly. He knows who you are. He knows your name. He calls you by his name. He's chosen you and he's anointed you. And he's telling us, he's promised us, you ask and I will give it to you. Ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit and I will give it to you. Our Father. He has given us his spirit. It lives in you. It lives in in me. And what kind of spirit is it? Is it any old spirit? Oh yes, you know, I can I can do a few things. God has enabled me to do a few things. Look at the kind of spirit we have. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. This is a magnificent and amazing, a miraculous a potent spirit that lives in you and me. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So we can walk in that authority. We have the right and the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So we can do amazing things. Look at the power that Jesus gave his disciples. He called them together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So I was telling you, I am a flawed follower of Christ. So what I'm doing today is just sharing some of the things that I have learned in the recent one or two years about the authority that we have in Christ. We have the authority over demons. We have the authority to cure diseases. We have the authority to stand in Jesus' name. We have the authority to claim favor because of what God has done for us. Do we often use this authority? Of course not. You know, There's a lot of authority sitting there wasted because we don't call on it. We don't use it. But it is there for us, and God has given it to us. Uh, when we lived in the Philippines, once uh, during a church service, uh, the pastor told us to break up into groups and pray for each other. So I was in this group, and one of the men there, they said, he said, please can you pray for me? I am suffering from stage four lung cancer. And here I was sitting and thinking, oh, he has stage four lung cancer. What hope is there for him? But anyway, we all prayed for this person. And the next Sunday, he stood up in church and he said he's just come from a checkup and his lungs are clear. And I was astounded. You know, God worked in spite of my unbelief. So very often, we don't trust God enough. We don't believe God enough. We don't take hold of the promises that he has 
for us, authority over demons and to cure diseases. So how can we approach God's throne? We can approach it with confidence. We don't have to come crawling. We can approach God's grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in times of need. So he's always there. He's always there. So sometimes we need to remind ourselves. We get, we get bogged down by our problems. I know this. You know, Is life always going to be a bed of roses? Of course not. There's always going to be trouble. All the more need we have of God and all the more resourceful he is in our inadequacies. Promises. I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So we can approach God with confidence, with courage, with boldness, knowing that we have a father who loves us. Again, Jesus said that the things I do, you will do greater things than these. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He redeemed people. We have the power to do that and greater. Okay. Uh, let us uh, look at a few things. So I am I am telling you that I have learned these things that we can walk in authority and we can claim the gifts of the Father. So what are some of the advantages of walking in this authority? One of it is it enables us to know who we are. We, got, we can claim our identity and as sons and daughters of the Most High. So we are not commoners. We are not the hoi polloi. We have the spirit of the living God living in us, and he has called us children. He hasn't called us slaves. He calls us friends. He calls us children. We are adopted into his family. Think of the power. You know, I can see before me, Princes and princesses sitting here, children of the Most High God. So it tells you who you are. It confirms your identity. So know this. Know who you are in Christ. It gives us a mindset of being victors, not victims. So we have authority. We have favor. And there are verses, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, you are an heir. So there's an inheritance for you, not just in the next life, but in this life too. God gives us victory through our Lord Jesus. We can expect favor because we know who we are. We are bought by Jesus' precious blood. He has paid a great price for us. So if, if uh, your husband gives you a diamond, you're going to take care of it. You're not going to throw it around here and there because he paid a big price for it. Did Panina lose a diamond? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus paid a big price for us. And our bodies, again, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Also, when we are going through hard times, we are always focusing on ourselves. Oh, poor me. Why me? What is this happening to me? I am just a little person. Who am I that God should love me or know my name? It takes the focus off us and puts it on our Father. So um, we don't have to be groveling in the dirt thinking we are nobody because we have a father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills.
the knowledge that we are never alone. And I think loneliness is, is a big issue in this day and age, right? But we have a father. My earthly father is not there anymore, but my heavenly father is never going to leave me or forsake me. And we can hold on to that knowledge that we have a father who's never going to leave us. He's always there with us. The Bible's full of people who have known the victory of the father. People who are just like you and me. Joseph, who was thrown into the pit, who was tempted, and yet who was victorious. Moses, you know, when Jennifer asked me to speak, I said, oh, I can't stand up in front of people. because I, I, I stutter and I stammer, and I'm thinking, well, Moses did the same, right? He said, oh, I can't, don't send me anywhere. I, I, can't, I don't know how to speak. You know, ask somebody else. But he was just like you and me. He was more like me than anybody else, and yet he learned to walk in victory because he knew the great I am. So God went with him and he did the job for him. Of course, Elijah, uh, who was just like us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed, and then it rained again. A man just like you and me. So the practical question, how do we claim authority in Christ? How do we do this? It's easy to say, how do we do this? So I boiled it down to two, to two easy, e easy uh, ways. Speaking the word over ourselves. And I know Jennifer gave us a list of God's promises. So when you wake up in the morning, speak these words over yourself. I am a child of God. And we sang that song today. So it's so appropriate. Thank you, Kathleen, for picking those songs. For uh, God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love of sound mind. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We were once in darkness, but we are children of light. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I shall not die, but live and declare the words of the Lord. So, so many gods of the God's promises that we can speak over ourselves and wash ourselves and cleanse ourselves with the word. And the Bible tells us that husbands wash your wives with the word and cleanse them. So speak these words over your family, over yourself, over your children. So one way is to speak the word over ourselves. Another, and we all know this, is to put on the whole armor of God. So one of my friends told me, every day when you wake up in the morning, do the actions. Put on the helmet of salvation. And then put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then shod your feet. So do the actions so you're reminding yourself about the armor of God, the whole armor of God, because Satan is very quick to find chinks in the armor and use that to pull us down, to discourage us. So the whole armor of God, and then, of course, praying always. So putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, girding our loins with truth, taking the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, which is the only aggressive uh, armor we have, and then shorting our feet with the gospel of good news, and then praying always. So speaking the word over yourselves in the morning, reminding yourselves of who we are in Christ, and putting on the whole armor of God. So how then shall we live? So let us live worthy of the calling we have received, for he who called us is faithful. 
So our hope and our trust is not in ourselves because we are finite, we are fallible, but in a God who called us and who is faithful to us. Today is Father's Day. I would like us to bless and honor our fathers. So may I ask fathers to kneel where you are? I hope your knees are not too rusty. If you would please kneel as a sign of surrender to God the Father. I'm going to ask families to surround your fathers. I'm going to ask people who might be nearby to lay your hands on fathers. Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> Fathers, be bold, kneel. Please surround the fathers. There should be more than family. Please don't be sitting. Please get up, surround the fathers. I will pray a blessing over them. You just have to do nothing. Just place your hand on your fathers. Thank you. We are a family. We are a community. Fathers have a tough role to play. Let's bless them. Let's honor them. Lord, we thank you for these fathers in our congregation. We honor and celebrate them as they submit themselves to you. We pray that you will lift them up, affirm them, let them hear your voice, let them be empowered as leaders of the home. May they look to you as they daily bear the responsibilities of families, knowing that they can cast their cares on you. May you honor the sacrifices they make. In times of stress and not knowing what to do, I pray that they may look to you and experience your unfailing love. Let them know that they are not defined by their failures, that they can trust you who began a good work in them and that we can trust you to bring that work to completion. Please fill their cups when they feel depleted and at the end of their wits. Please give them wisdom when they need it, patience when they are at the end of the tethers, and the ability to love at all times. Fathers, may you be good teachers modeling Christ to your children. May you be blessed by your children and recognized for all effort and sacrifices you make. Fathers, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He has called you by name, chosen you, anointed you. You are his son. We commit our fathers into your hands, Lord Jesus, to model themselves after you our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. We thank you, Mina, for the message. I need to do a translation at the same time. We thank you, Mina, for the message. We thank you, Mina, for the message. I'm speaking in Cantonese at the same time. 
I'm supposed to translate, but you know, I, my brain is not as fast as you, so I got confused. So we want to honor our father today because today is Father's Day. Because today is Father's Day. And we would like to uh, have someone to bring forward the gift. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we have a very good team here. At the back, we can see people moving around so quickly. So may I invite the father? Uh, to come over to to get the gift we have prepared for for you guys. May I ask the father after you get the gift, please come to the stage. We have our professional Catherine to help us to take photo. <laughs> Someone have to remove this. We will have a nice picture. Yes. Catherine, give us some direction. To make it two lines? Thank you. Uh, I was asked to pray for you guys, so oh, may I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dear Lord, dear Father, we thank you for today, O oh God. We praise you for all our godly Father here in this lighthouse. We can see their dedication, their love to their family, and we can see the fruit today. We can see all our children, our youngsters in this church serving because we have godly family. We have the godly head of the family on the stage. We thank you for all of them. We continue to ask you to bless them, guide them. May your Holy Spirit always fill them with joy, power. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. We can see the growth of this church because of your mercy and grace. Oh, God, we thank for all the fathers, their, their love to their family, to their wife, their children. Thank you, Jesus, oh God. In, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we have a lucky, a, a special draw. <laughs> Stay, oh, we only have one very special gift. <laughs> okay, we we'll ask Auntie, uh, uh, Sister Lisa to, to make the draw. This is a even you are not the one. <laughs> we need to shake. Okay, yeah. Do we need some background music?
Thank you, fathers. We also have some props for you to take photos with your family or yourself. Selfie, or we have different uh, professional photographer can help you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you everyone, thank you those online, thank you for joining us. It's a photo time, see? The first, the first already occupied the space. <laughs>